Let's open up our Bibles to Isaiah chapter 56. <clears throat> I'm going to give you just a real quick summary of the chapter before we get into it so you have an idea of what we'll be talking about. <clears throat> a lot of it tonight will be just reading through it because it's self-explanatory. Um, what God is saying concerning idolatry, concerning sins, and so forth. But God's heart really is that we walk righteously. Now, we have to be careful when we say that because it all depends on your perspective what that means. If you come from a Calvinistic perspective, then it's your own righteousness, that you are righteous, you're holy, you're pure in every sense of the word. In other words, you don't sin. And there are people that believe that, that they can go without sinning. If they can just practice... uh, not sinning for one hour or a half an hour or for a minute, then maybe they can go for two hours without sinning and three hours without sinning and four hours. And that's the goal. And one day they'll be going a whole month without ever sinning. And they really think that you can walk without sinning. And you just can't. You can't. That's, that's arrogance and that's sin in itself right there. Because <laughs> the Bible tells us that every man's a sinner. We all fall short of God's glory. So when he speaks about the righteousness here, you have to really look at the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and look at the men that he chose. Look at Adam, the very first man. You would think that uh, having been made in the likeness of God and in his image that he would have everything that he needs to be righteous. And yet he listened to his wife uh, and he fell into sin and sin entered into the world, and here we are today. And now sin has become our nature. And you look at the men like Moses, you look at the men like David, you look at the men like Isaiah, and so forth. Isaiah admitted it. You know, woe am I, a man of unclean lips. You know, he acknowledged that. And God uses broken vessels, in a sense. He uses men that are sinners, that recognize their faults and their shortcomings, that are open with those things to God. You know, you look at the apostles, 12 disciples, and I don't think there were one that were any righteous than the other. They were all men fallen short of God's glory, you know, completely. They argued, they fought against each other, they wanted position, they were arrogant, they were prideful, you know, they were using the gifts, you know, um, for prestige in a sense, you know, and so forth, and you can just go on and on. And even after the Holy Spirit came, Peter was uh, busted for for being ashamed of the truth, siding with the Judaizers. Paul had to correct him. You know, Paul had a thorn in his side. He had some weaknesses. And so God uses broken vessels. And so when he talks about a man of righteousness, it reminds me of the story where where Jesus is talking about the religious leaders and so forth. And the disciples said, well, then who can be saved? Because Jesus said, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees, of the Sadducees, of the religious leaders of our time, and you know how religious they are. They're very religious. They serve in the temple. They wear their robes. They wear their phylacteries to remind you that the Word of God is there, and they're constantly praying, constantly reciting the Word of God. Unless your righteousness can surpass them, you can never be saved. And that's what the disciples thought. Boy, we'll never be saved. And Jesus said, well, what's impossible with man is possible with God. Because what, what happened was is that Jesus gave us His righteousness. And so his righteousness has been imputed to our account. It's as though we have a bank account, and in that bank account there is righteousness that we can draw from. If somebody uh, put in a million dollars into your account, guess what? Then you've been imputed a millionaire. You are a millionaire. You may never use it, and it's there, but you're a millionaire, and you can draw from it any time you want. Same thing with God's righteousness. He has imputed to us in our account righteousness. And so we're righteous before him because of Jesus Christ. Now, that moves us to want to be righteous in that fleshly realm. We don't want to sin against him. We want to stand right before him. And when we do sin, it convicts us. It hurts us because we know it hurts him because we're not walking right with him. And in fact, there are times where you feel ashamed to even call upon his name. And that's what sin does. It pushes you away from him. That's what it's designed to do. It's exactly what the devil does with it. And God wants to draw us to him. And thus, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all our unrighteousness. So walking in righteousness, in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, that's where we ought to be walking. And so in this chapter here, God calls upon the children of Israel to walk in righteousness. Now, He's going to share with us that we are to keep his righteousness and his justice. 
because his salvation is near. It's coming. Not that uh, they're, they're going to be delivered from the Babylonian captivity. They are. But he's talking about the future event. That salvation, when it's finally complete, it's finally over, God has come back at that second coming and he has basically begun the millennium age where we will rule and reign with him in the heavenly realm. And then he will also talk about the outcast, how he's chosen Israel, but he also has a, another group of people. And Jesus said the same thing, right? I have other, other sheep that you don't know of. Speaking of the Gentile world, that's us and how God was going to bring them into the Gentile world. The Jews didn't understand that. They didn't understand that at all. And that's why they made a, a court for the Gentiles in the temple itself when that's not what God wanted. He wanted them to come in together in unity. And then how Israel was blinded. Their watchmen were blinded. They had watchmen that were to watch out for the children of Israel. They were to watch out uh, for their spiritual walk with God, and yet they were so blinded that they were missing it, and they weren't watching correctly. And so a call to righteousness is verse 1. Thus says the Lord, Keep justice and do righteousness, for my salvation is about to come, and my righteousness to be revealed. Remember, Peter talks about how God is waiting to reveal his righteousness, that none should perish, but that all would come to repentance, he said. And then the salvation of the Lord would come. Now, people confuse the first coming with the second coming of Jesus Christ. They often think the second coming is at the rapture. I remember a a guy from Bible college came out and I asked him to teach on the on the um, second coming of Jesus Christ. And at the last minute, he bailed out because he didn't understand uh, that it wasn't the rapture. It was the second coming of Christ. The first coming of Christ was when? When he came to this earth and he walked among us. The rapture is a totally different event. The rapture is when he comes and he, we are caught up in the air. That's an event we're caught up, but he isn't coming here. The second coming is when he comes here in judgment upon the earth because of the sins that men have committed against God. That's the second coming of God, and they get that confused. And so the second coming is when God will finally establish that salvation. And so our time is short. I think it's really short. You look around this. I just read that... Uh, that now Libya, Syria, and some of the other nations are starting to shoot rockets into Israel. They're surrounded Israel, completely surrounding them. And they're working hard at creating peace. They're negotiating Israel, saying, hey, we'll we'll work towards it as long as they stop firing missiles into this place. You know, can you imagine if if there was a, a... a surrounding nation firing missiles into the United States? What would happen if they started doing that to New York? Do you think we'd just sit around? Of course not. We would fight back. You know, and we're expecting Israel to just sit around. And it's, it's evidence that the, sh- the time is short. And so, what should we be doing? We should be working. We should be excited about what God is doing. We should be excited about what the future has. You know, this event, this uh, Calvary Chapel uh, summer fest that we're putting on, this is a great opportunity. It's scary because it's a big opportunity. It's something that's beyond our capability it really is when you think about it and you look at it <clears throat> it's way beyond us and so god has to be involved in it uh, we need to really be in prayer and i hope you're in prayer i, I hope you're not doing it in your own works because then it's going to fail if if we're doing it in our own strength but if we're on our knees if we're seeking god and we're asking him to do it because it's a big task and we can't do it you know, and if we're saying, oh, everything will be okay, everything will be okay. No, we need to give it to the Lord. We need to say, God is going to handle it. God is going to take care of it. God will provide for it. And so we, should, we need to be busy praying and seeking the Lord's strength and his power, seeking for those opportunities to reach out and see men saved. And so God calls us to what? To keep justice and to walk in righteousness. And so we are to be men and women of justice of righteousness Uh, living for the lord is what he's asking us to do here he said blessed is the man who does this i mean that is so so simple and fundamental to christianity that if a man would just keep the word of the lord his life would be blessed you know james tells us that there's wars and battles and fights because of our own selfishness 
And that's why we struggle in our relationships. That's why churches struggle because we're not walking in justice and in righteousness and we're not blessed. And so we need to be blessed by doing those things and we will be blessed. And the son of man who lays hold on it, who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and keeps his hands from doing evil. Now, he's talking about the Sabbath, the covenant that he had with Israel and how they were defiling keeping that sabbath god had created the heavens earth and on the seventh day he rested the sabbath day and that was a day of rest and it was a day to worship god to seek god um, to meditate upon the godly things to take your family and 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 have a time of peace and rest and uh, relaxing from the labor of the of the whole week We see it in the Old Testament that it was a day set apart unto God, and it was a commandment of God for them to do. They weren't doing that. They weren't doing that. They were worshiping idols. They were forgetting the Sabbath day. They weren't resting in the Lord, kind of like what we do today. We think that the Sabbath day is a day to, to have fun. Yeah, we don't work, but we don't do anything else. And we just relax or we go to the mountains, we go to the beach and we do all these things. But we really don't focus on the Lord. The Sabbath is really made for us to focus on the Lord. To come to church and to come expecting Him to speak to us. Expecting, expecting Him to do a work and blessing us. And, and us ministering to Him in worship and, and doing it with a heart that says, Lord, I'm here to worship you on this Sabbath day. Now, of course, our Sabbath is on a Sunday because there is no Sabbath for the church. Every day is the Sabbath day, Paul said, and we're to worship him every day. And so he had a problem with them at that time because they weren't keeping the Sabbath. They were defiling the Sabbath. We know through Ezekiel that that in the temple itself, they were bringing in idols and they were worshiping these idols within the temple itself. And God was disgusted at that. And he said, uh, and keeps his hand from doing evil. Now, there's a promise for this foreigner, this Gentile. He's talking to the Jews, and he's telling them to keep the Sabbath holy. He's saying that 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 Sabbath is set apart, not just for the Jews, but also for the Gentiles, and you are to come together and worship the Lord, but they weren't doing that. Do not let the son of the foreigner, that is the Gentiles, who has joined himself to the Lord, speak, saying, the Lord has utterly separated me from his people. Nor let let the eunuch say, here, I am a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuch who keeps my Sabbath and chooses what pleases me and holds fast my covenant. Even to them I will give in my house and within my walls a place and a name better than that of sons and daughters who will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Now, they, they weren't allowing the Gentiles to come in and worship the Lord. And God is saying here the Gentiles desired to come in and worship the Lord. They had a heart for God. They were converted. In in a sense, there was a revival among the Gentiles. And they really knew God more than the sons and daughters, that is Israel. And so God was upset and says, you're not letting them come in. And yet they want to come in. And I'm going to bless them when they come in. Um, As I said earlier to this day, they, they made a court for the Gentiles. And you remember the Apostle Paul was accused of bringing a Gentile into the Jewish courts. And they were going to kill Paul because of that. And that wasn't true. It was an accusation, just a a setup to try to kill Paul. And yet God never intended that to be the case at all. The Bible says that we as Gentiles have been grafted into the Jewish nation. We are also his sons and daughters. In Romans 11, 17, if some of the branches were broken off and you being a wild olive tree, that's a Gentile, were grafted in among them and with them became partakers of the root and fatness of the olive tree. And so we became partakers of the Jews. Also the sons of the foreigners who joined themselves to the Lord to serve Him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be His servants, everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and hold fast my covenant. I mean, they kept even His covenant as as foreigners not born into the Jewish nation. Even them... I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifice will be accepted on the altar for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all nations. The Jews did not keep this at all. Now isn't it interesting that here you have a foreign people more excited about God than the people of God themselves. You can tell by God's nudging Isaiah to write this that the 
nation Israel had lost that relationship with God, that passion, and they were more into religion, they were more into the culture, they were more into idolatry than they were into God. That is a sad place to be. God needs to be number one in your life. And and God isn't number one in a lot of people's lives. You just look at the way they live, and you can tell He's not number one. He needs to be number one in your life. Otherwise, you will not survive. You won't survive in the ministry. You won't survive in your relationships. You won't survive at all, completely. When we were at the pastor's conference, uh, a pastor, um, I think I mentioned this on Sunday, maybe I I didn't, Um, but this pastor um, mentioned that he he, uh, left his church kind of in in a situation that he was really concerned about, took the church over for eight months, and there were a lot of accusations, uh, people accusing him, his wife, a new leadership um, of a lot of things. There was division, the church was in chaos, and so forth. And, and he was sitting there going, what do I do? How do I handle this? You know, I mean, he was just broken. He was completely broken. So he was, he was literally broken. He was broken broken i didn't know what to do and the answer was trust in the lord it is your relationship with jesus christ that gets you through it is that intimacy that you have with him that he is your sufficiency that it doesn't matter what anyone else does or say you stay the course and you continue to go straight I was listening to a, a video by Jacob Presh today, and um, he was defending uh, Calvary Chapel. He was mentioning uh, Chuck Smith and how Chuck Smith stood up for, for righteousness. And um, he was saying that Chuck even stood up against his own family. That there were family members that were involved in the emerging church, and so he let him go. Lonnie Frizzy, um, John, I think John uh, West. Westberg, I believe it's his last name, who started the vineyard that, that came into the, into the church and tried to create a Pentecostal type of movement and so forth, and, and he stood up even to them. And that's difficult to do, to even stand up to your own family. You have to have a strong relationship with Jesus Christ in order to do something like that. You have to totally trust him completely. And if you don't, then it's not going to work at all. Verse 8, the Lord God who gathers the outcasts of Israel says, yet I will gather to him others besides those who are gathered to him. Again, he's talking about the Gentiles. All you beasts of the field come to devour. All you beasts in the forest. His watchmen are blind. They are all ignorant. They are all dumb dogs. (laughs) Uh, They cannot bark. Sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. Yes, they are greedy dogs which never have enough. And they are shepherds who cannot understand. They all look to their own way, every one for his own gain from his own territory. Uh, This is the children of Israel. They were ignorant. They were dumb dogs. I mean, God describes them uh, very clearly here about their religion and their faith in in God, it wasn't one that was according to the scriptures. I think of some of the pastors today who have bought into the lie of, of the same-sex marriage and allowing it within the church, who are allowing this to, to be um, a part of the church because it's reaching the culture. You know? and, and I w- can almost I can almost hear God saying the same thing. These are blind watchmen. They're supposed to be taking care of the sheep, but they're misleading the sheep. You know, they're supposed to be watching over, and they're ignorant. They think they're, they're intelligent and they're smart, and yet they're ignorant to it. I just read a, a something from a high school friend that says, I will follow any uh, religious system that really holds my own values. And I'm like, wow, <laughs> that makes total sense. That's true religion, right? Uh, you follow something that holds your values. You know, your values. I mean, hey, I'll follow you if, if you have the same values as I have. That's not Christianity. If you think Christianity is, is having your own values followed, you're wrong. Christianity is following God's values and what God says is truth. And then you submitting to him 
humbling yourself, saying, I don't know nothing, Lord. You know everything. You're God. You created the heavens and the earth. And here I am with my arrogance, think that I can run my own life my own way. You're wrong. It needs to be run by God's way, by God's word, and nothing else. Otherwise, you run into trouble. You're just blind, you're ignorant, and dumb dogs, as the, as the Bible says here. And for selfish reasons. You know, you see these pastors and these pulpits, and they're doing it just for, for money's sake. It really, it's selfishness, and that's what he's describing here. Selfishness, self-gain, greediness, and so forth. He says, come, one says, and I will bring wine. And we will fill ourselves with intoxicating drink. Tomorrow we will be as today and much more abundant. Uh, I was listening to Chuck Swindoll the other day and he was talking about a pastor friend of his who looked into this whole topic of, of drinking. And he came back to him and says, I, in all of my study and I studied it exhausted, I find nowhere where it says I cannot drink. He says, so I, I can have a drink. And he said that his friend went ahead and had a drink. And his wife and himself went to a winery and had a drink. And they go to dinner and have a drink. And they would go to another winery and have a drink. And they met a couple of people there that also have drinks. They didn't get drunk, but they had drinks. And they met these people, and pretty soon they were going to wineries every weekend and you know so forth, having drinks. And then that went to going to their house, having drinks. And then they went to parties, having drinks. And pretty soon he was no longer in the ministry because he was going to nightclubs, having drinks. You know, It only opens up the door for the enemy to come in and entice you to do more of his work than God's work. You know, it's amazing how we, we try to... In, 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 I like what Chuck has always said whenever I listen to him. It's, I'd rather err on the side of righteousness than on the side of the flesh, you know? If anything, I'd rather err that side, you know? Hey, it, if we really don't know about wine, then don't do it. Don't do it at all. It's better not to do it at all than to be wrong in it. You know? That is really wisdom. Chapter 57, we see the spiritual adultery upon the children of Israel, um, the righteous find peace truly in their in their death is what the context here is. Uh, the rebels, though, will make their beds wide of destruction. Uh, their idols that they worshipped would not save them. And so they were accused forever. The righteous perish, and no man takes it. To heart, merciful men are taken away, while no one considers that the righteous is taken away from evil. Um, some have suggested that this is a scripture for the rapture, that the righteous perish or they're taken or raptured up. So it could be that he's speaking here of they're raptured up, and it's a, a thought that during the rapture that no one even takes notice of the righteous being raptured. Now, isn't that interesting? That when the rapture happens, what is the world going to do? That's the question. You know, how are they going to explain this? And well, it couldn't be God, obviously. You know, this blindness will come upon them. You know, they're going to take all the resources and the government's going to use it for their own benefits and so forth. But they won't even notice it, in a sense. But yet, millions, if not billions of people will be raptured up, taken up. He shall enter into peace. Thank God for that. They shall rest in their beds, each one walking in his righteous or unrighteousness. But come here, you sons of sorcerers, you offspring of the adulterers and the harlots. Now he's speaking spiritually here, speaking of their idolatry and their pagan religions. And really that is, I, that is adultery to the Lord, right? That's what the Bible calls spiritual adultery. It's what we commit against God himself when we worship other things. And it doesn't matter what that other thing, anything that we worship before God is idolatry. Whether it's material things or whether it's an individual, whether it's even a, even a church, if it comes before God, it is idolatry and it is considered adultery. Whom do you ridicule? Against whom do you make a wide mouth and stick out the tongue? You can get that picture. Are you not children of transgressions, offspring of falsehood, inflaming yourself with gods under every green tree, slaying the children of the valley under the cliffs of the rocks? So these are their offerings to their gods. 
This is how they offered to their gods, even their own children offerings. Molech, offering their children to God. Today we, we call it abortion, offering our children up to pleasure uh, because we can't afford it or because we don't want to be burdened with the responsibility of raising children. And so we offer these children up in these abortions and it's the same thing. It's, it's idolatry. And God hates it. Boy, does he hate it. Among the, the smooth stones of the streams is your portion. They, they are your lot. Even to them you have poured a drink offering. You have offered a grain offering. Should I receive comfort in this? On a lofty and high mountain you have set your bed. Um, a bed of, an, uh, of adultery. In other words, that's where they would worship. You know, They would go to a high mountain, set up an altar, and they would offer up their sacrifices up there. And so he's talking about those sacrifices there. It's a bed of adultery. You know. Even there you went up to offer sacrifice. Also behind the doors and in their posts you have set up your remembrance. For you have uncovered yourself to those other than me and have gone up to them. You have enlarged your bed and made a covenant with them. You have loved their bed where you saw their, their nudity. You went to the king with ointment and increased your perfume. You sent your messengers far off and even descendants of shale. You were wearied in the length of your way, yet you did not say there is no hope. You, found, you have found the life of your hand, therefore you were not grieved. They were drenched in this and they didn't even realize it. You know, you, you can go into this type of idolatry and not even realize like like i share with you that person that was his view you know i will join any religion as long as it has my values he's blind completely blinded has no understanding whatsoever his god is himself and what he thinks is right you know and there he's oblivious to what truth is you know and we need to be careful of that that we are not like that of whom and of whom have you been afraid or feared that you have lied and not remembered me, nor taken it to your heart? Is it not because I have held my peace from of old that you do not fear me? I will declare your righteousness and your works, for they will not profit you. When you cry out, let your collection of idols deliver you, but the wind will carry them away. A breath will take them, but he who puts his trust in me shall possess the land and shall inherit my holy mountain. So the contrast there. Let your idols deliver you. God made mention to the fact, because I have been merciful and gracious to you all these years, that you think that you don't have to fear me. I think that's where the United States is, right? You know, we're, we're at a place where we don't have reverence and fear for God anymore because he's just been so good to us as a nation. He's just been so wonderful. And so we don't fear him. And we need to fear him. We need to get back to that reverence uh, that this nation really was under, knowing that we serve an awesome and pure God, that we may inherit the holy mountain. And the one who says, heap it up, heap it up, prepare the way, take the stumbling block out of the the way of my people. For thus says the high and lofty one who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit. Now there's a, uh, something to highlight. It's with him who has a contrite and humble spirit. I mean, that's really the key uh, to our walk on this earth is, is having a contrite spirit and a humble spirit. Uh, don't say much. Virginia has always taught me you know, if you have nothing good to say, don't say it at all. That's a, that's a simple phrase, simple truth, but it is such a hard thing to do, isn't it? You know, and I've struggled all these years. You know? Now, I can tell her, but she'll usually tell me that. Oh, if you've got nothing good to say, don't say it at all. You know, but we, we sh- really shouldn't say anything at all. And we should be humble in spirit, contrite in spirit. To revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. For I will not contend forever, nor will I always be angry, for the spirit would fail before me and the souls which I have made. For the iniquity of his covetousness, I was angry and struck him. I hid and I and was angry, and he went on backsliding in the way of his heart. I have seen his ways and will heal him. I will also lead him 
and restore comfort to him and to his mourners. I create the fruit of the lips, peace, peace to him who is far off and to him who is near, says the Lord, and I will heal him. But the wicked are like a troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mere and dirt. There is no peace, says the Lord, or says my God, for the wicked. And so God watches over the righteous, but judges the wicked. In chapter 8, we see the blessings of of true worship here. And those that uh, seek pleasure on these, uh, also these fast days. Uh, So cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet. Tell my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sin. Now that's a tough job really to have. Can you imagine Isaiah? I mean, you think of the Old Testament prophets and the job that they have. It's pretty tough when you're, you know, bringing judgment down upon a people, you know, and it's constant. And it's bad news. It's like you're the bearer of bad news all the time. You know, uh, it's kind of like a pastor's job today. It seems sometimes that you're a bearer of bad news all the time. You try to, you know, I, I, as I read those chapters, I'm like, Lord, show me something where, I, where there's some good news there. I mean, and obviously there is. Salvation is near. You know, the Lord loves us enough to correct us, but it just seems like you're a bearer of bad news. The sinners, transgressions, you know, darkness and, and all of this stuff. But it's a warning to us, you know, just like we saw Sunday. We need to be reminded of this because we forget so quickly. And so we need to be reminded not to sin, to be humble, to be contrite. But it's a tough job. You, lo- you lose a lot of friendships that way. Uh, it's, it's, it's a lonely job. Yet they seek me daily and delight to know my ways. As a nation that did righteous and did not forsake the ordinance of their God, they ask of me the ordinance of justice. They take delight in approaching God. Again, in their fasting. They have, or why have we fasted, they say, and you have not seen? Why have we afflicted our souls and you take no notice? In fact, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure and exploit all your labors. Indeed, you fast for strife and debate and to strike with the fist of wicked. You will not fast as you do this day to make your voice heard on high. It, or is it a fast that I have chosen, a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head like a bulrush and to spread out sackcloth and ashes? Would you call this a fast and an acceptable day to the Lord? I mean, they weren't really being sincere in their fasting, as I said earlier. And so God's calling them really on this issue when you're fasting. Uh, we know about fasting. The scripture talks a lot about fasting. Uh, it, when we fast, we need to make sure that it's the Lord that's calling us to fast. And we're not fasting to lose weight. You know, well, I'm going to fast, you know, because I'm going to lose weight at the same time. Uh, I, I've seen ladies uh, do that. You know, I'm fasting every Monday, but they're also at the same time trying to lose weight, so they call it a Monday fast. You know, well, no, fasting is really uh, fasting from food, you know, and seeking the Lord, setting yourself apart to seek God because you need strength, because you need guidance, you need direction, and so you sacrifice, you know, your flesh to try to get into the, the spiritual realm in a sense. We don't do that too often, um, in the right way, in the right manner. And this is God's perspective on it when we don't. Is this not the fast that I have chosen to loose the bonds of the wicked, to undo the, um, the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free and that you break every yoke? Is it not to spare your bread with the, share your bread with the hungry and that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out? When you see the naked, that you cover him and not hide yourself from their own flesh. So obviously they weren't doing this. Here they were fasting, seeking God, and asking Him, why why aren't you answering us? And yet they weren't feeding the hungry. They weren't clothing the poor. They weren't housing them. They weren't taking care of those needs there. But yet they wanted God. That was something that um, challenged me that I noticed in, in Christianity when I first got saved, that, that this Christianity, the Christianity of the Bible that, that I was reading, because I, I was reading, and you cannot get any other picture if you're reading this, is not 
a Christianity that just sits down and goes to church. It just isn't. If you're reading your Bible, you don't get that. It's a Christianity that works, that helps people. There's someone here in the in the church that that uh, did exactly what I did when when I got saved, and uh, they were sharing with me they'll they'll be working and they work alone and they'll see someone homeless and they'll go over to them and they'll offer them food. You know? And I remember doing that. I remember working in this community here, and I happened to park by the railroads over there by uh, Valley View, and I was railroad tracks doing a job on the meter there, and there was this big uh, 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 what do you call them? Uh, peppermint tree you know just huge and I was doing my job then I sat down opened up my lunch to have lunch afterwards and then I noticed in the in the tree there was this dark little thing I looked and there's this homeless guy reading a newspaper in there you know so I just kind of said hey how's it going we started talking and it turned out he was actually a lawyer who who chose to be homeless because his wife left him for his best friend and he couldn't take it so he said that's it I give up on the world and so he's living on the street. Intelligent man. Started talking about Christianity. Knew everything you know, about it. So I, I gave him my, my lunch. Said, Here, you, you can have this. He, he appreciated it. And I prayed with him and so forth. But I realized that that's what Christianity was. And you don't just go to church. You don't give a little money. And then you go home and live your life. Nah, uh You're actually involved in God's kingdom. And, and the people that aren't involved are the people that aren't reading this because you don't get that when you read this you don't get that and you don't get that when you read isaiah and he's talking about all the things they weren't doing they're supposed to be doing you know yeah these are social things but we're supposed to be doing those social things too and that's why we you know took on thanksgiving day and fed 200 people you know some homeless some in this community and we reached out and we fed them that's a good thing to do that's something that god smiled upon you know, to reach out to people and to help them. The food ministry, you know, twice a month, twice a month that we give out food, you know, to people. Those are good things to do, to clothe people. Someone came in, you know, to the church. And it's interesting. You see the perspectives, the different perspectives. Someone comes into the church, you know, and we're expecting them to catch the vision, understand who God is. They come into the church and almost immediately say, oh, I have a friend who has a need. And we immediately meet that need. We start buying clothes. People bought clothes. People helped the need. Never saw the friend. We just trusted that she had a friend and we gave him to her. You know, and she started coming here, but then she's gone. Just like that. What's her perspective? I don't think it's correct. But what's our perspective? I think it's correct. We reached out. We helped. We, we shared the gospel. We shared our love by giving like that. Whether they received it or not, I don't know the friend, but I know the person's not here anymore. So, so obviously there was an ulterior motive there, but that doesn't matter. What matters is that we feed the poor, that we clothe the naked. That's what God wants. <clears throat> and then he hears our prayers. And I think that's one of the reasons that um, this church is still alive. I really do. I think because we do reach out to the poor, we feed the homeless, and we support Israel. And I think that's why we're still here. I really do. Then your light shall break forth like the morning. Your healing shall spring forth speedily and your righteousness shall go before me. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry and he will say, I'm here. If you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and the speaking wickedness, if you extend your soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted souls, then your light shall dawn in the darkness and your darkness shall be as the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually and satisfy your soul in drought and strengthen your bones. You shall be like the watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters do not fail those from among you shall build the old waste places you shall rise up the fountains of many generations and you shall be called the repairs of the breach and the restorers of the streets to dwell in them if you turn away your foot from the sabbath from doing your pleasures on your on my holy day and call the sabbath a delight the holy day of the lord honorable and shall honor him not doing your own ways nor finding your own pleasures nor speaking your own words then you shall delight yourself in the lord and i will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth and feed you with the heritage of jacob your father 
The mouth, the mouth of the Lord has spoken. I mean, those are very clear how we ought to approach the Sabbath day. Um, years ago, we had a family here, beautiful family. Um, we had a beautiful family here. Uh, kids just loved the children's ministry. The older ones loved being in church. They were being fed because they were just they were just coming to know Christ, and they wanted to go to church on on Sundays. And so they started coming. Well, they were heavily involved in soccer, football, and baseball, and so forth. And all of a sudden, they those events fell on on Sunday, and they started going to the events more than church. And so we would not see them weeks at a time. And then they'd come in, and you know, oh, where have you been? Oh, guy, the so and so had a game, and so and so had another game, and. So, oh, that's too bad, you know, because church is important. And we talked to the kids, and the kids were like, we want to go to church. We don't want to be involved in the games. But it was the parents pushing them to go to the games. You know? And it was sad because eventually they just stopped coming at all. You know? Because they misused God's Sabbath. They put other things first than the Sabbath day of the Lord. <clears throat> chapter 59. In this chapter, he talks about Sin separating us from God. We talked a little bit about that Monday night, our sins and how it separates us. There's only one purpose for sin and that is to destroy us. That's it, just to destroy us. The Bible's very clear, the wages of sin is death. The soul that sins surely will die. And so missing the mark is a definition of sin. God has set a mark it's his word that, that sets that mark. It is his word that gives us that mark, and we've missed that mark. And because we miss that mark, then the wage of that is death in itself. Paul said that whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. If he sows to the Spirit, then he will reap to the Spirit. If he sows to the flesh, then he will reap to the flesh. And so if you sin... To the flesh, if you continue to sin, then you will reap the consequences of that. Sin will always destroy us. And so we need to think twice before we sin what the repercussions will be. We need to think twice. Even in those sins of knowing to do good and yet we don't do it, there's repercussions in those things. The opportunities that we have to serve the Lord, we miss out on the blessings of the Lord when we could be serving the Lord. And so you're reaping what you sowed in not helping and not participating in the kingdom of God. And so many are just going to go to heaven but with no rewards. Imagine the rewards they could have had if they just sowed to the spirit and not to the flesh. They live this life in their own pleasures, and they, know, they knew the Lord, and they loved the Lord, and they, they went to church, and you know they lived a moral life, but they really were not active in the kingdom of God. And there are a lot of people like that, a whole lot of people like that. You know, I, I think of just our little church here, and everyone's wonderful, I love them all, and they come to church, but so many are not serving the Lord. So many are not involved. They just come and they just go. You know, and they need to get involved, and they're missing out. They're sowing or they're reaping what they're sowing, and that's nothing. God has a work for us. Ephesians is very clear in, in chapter 2, verse 10, that he created a work for us to walk in beforehand. And so there are works for us to do, but we don't do them. For whatever reason, we're not doing them. We need to do it. A man doesn't take his hands to the plow and then start looking back. And the day that you asked Christ into your heart, you took your hands to the plow and said, Lord, I'm surrendering to you. You now are my master. I am your servant or your slave. Jude said, I'm bond servant, servant of Jesus Christ. Paul said the same thing. The, all the apostles said the same thing. They were servants of the Lord. And so whatever the master asked, that's what they did. Isn't that what Jesus said? Father, I do all things that you ask of me. There's nothing he doesn't do that the Father... In fact, everything he did, as an example to us, everything that he did, every step that he took, every action he had, every miracle was because the Father asked him to do it. There was a couple of times where Jesus said, I'd like to do this, but not my will, your will be done. And then he did what the Father asked. 
That's what we should be doing. Lord, whatever you want me to do, no matter what, I won't fear man, I won't fear the repercussions, I will do it completely. Um, It's a scary thing standing up behind the pulpit and talking about same-sex marriage because pastors in Canada are being arrested and thrown in jail. It's a scary thing to be living in Iran and then professing to be a Christian because then you could be thrown in jail. Uh, This woman who's has been thrown in jail, married to an American Christian. They were over there, and they took her. She's pregnant, and she's in jail. And they were going to behead her. Once the baby was born, they were going to take the baby and give it to a Muslim family. Well, through the pressure of the United States, they let her go. And so they headed straight for the airport. When they got to the airport, they arrested her. To try, because they asked her not to leave so quickly, and so she violated the, the agreement, and they put her right back in jail. Yeah. And she's still there to this day. This is a pregnant woman with a child who's Christian. Yeah. She put her hands to the plow, and she said, Lord, whatever your will is, that's what I'll do. Yeah. We need to understand what we are agreeing to. So he talks about the sin and how it separates us. Justice is far from us. And that truth was nowhere really to be found. So the Lord puts this uh, garment of salvation and fury in this chapter. He says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save, nor is ear heavy that it cannot hear. You know, oftentimes it's not that the Lord doesn't hear us, it's that, uh, that we don't hear him. We don't hear him, or we don't want to hear him because we're selfish and we want our own way. So that's not really what you're asking me to do, Lord. You're not telling me to give up that, Lord. You're not asking me to go in that direction, Lord. You're not asking me to humble myself, Lord. Not at all. And then then we go and we say, Lord, why aren't you hearing me? You know, why aren't you blessing me? You know, the Lord's saying, I'd love to bless you, but man, you're not hearing me at all. And so I'm not going to bless you until you start listening to me. Start listening to me. Now, they were fasting here. Um, and so they were misusing this fast. He says, But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so that he does not hear you, or will not hear you, actually. So again, sin separates you from God more than anything else. Not only the repercussions of it in this life, but the, the, the fact that it separates you from God himself in that relationship. And boy, that's where your power is. Can you imagine your car being separated from its gas? Because you sin, I separate your gas from your car. You can go nowhere without gas. Because you sin, I separate you from God. So you can do nothing. Now, you might have the appearance of of a Christian. You might say hallelujah and praise the Lord, but God is separating. He doesn't hear your prayers because you're walking in sin. You're practicing sin. You're not humbling, humbling yourself according to the word of the Lord. And until you do so, he will not hear you, he said. For your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue has muttered perversity. Uh, again, this was in the context of fasting. They're fasting, they're praying. In one moment, they're saying, God, help us. God, we love you. We're sacrificing. At the next, they're speaking lies. They're, they're professing perversities and so forth. And then they're wondering, God, why aren't you answering us? You know, it doesn't work like that. That's not a relationship that is humble to the Lord at all. So when we pray, we need to pray in purity of heart, actually in sincerity of heart with the Lord. No one calls for justice, nor does any plea for truth. They trust in empty words and speak lies. They conceive evil and bring forth iniquity they have hatched viper eggs and wave the spider's web weave the spider's web he who eats their of their eggs dies and from that which is crushed a viper breaks out their webs will not become garments nor will they cover themselves with their works their works are, are works of iniquity and The axe of violence is in their hand. Their feet run to evil and they make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity, wasting and destructions are in their path. The way of peace they have not known and there is no justice in their ways. 
They have made themselves crooked paths. Whoever takes that way shall not know peace. I mean, that's pretty clear. You can see uh, how far they are from God there. And because of that sin, darkness comes upon them. Therefore, justice is far from us, nor does righteousness overtake us. We look for light, but there is darkness. For brightness, but we walk in darkness. We grope for the wall like the blind, and we grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday as at twilight. We are as dead men in desolate places. We all growl like bears and mourn sadly like doves. We look for justice, but there is none. For salvation, but it is far from us. For our transgressions are multiplied before you and our sins testify against you. For our transgressions are with us and as for our iniquities, we know them. In transgressions, we in transgressing and lying against the Lord and departing from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood, justice is turned back and the righteousness stand afar off for truth is fallen in the street and iniquity cannot enter. So faith, truth fails and he who departs from evil makes himself a prey. Then the Lord saw it and it displeased him that there was no justice. How sad. How sad that the heart was not for the Lord. And the repercussion of that was to walk in, in darkness. He saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no transgressor or intercessor, I'm sorry. Therefore, his own arm brought salvation for him and his own righteousness is sustained him. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on the garment of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, according to, or according he will repay fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies. The coastland he will fu- fully repay. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun, when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. So in other words, um, you know, they'd utterly be perished unless God intervenes and he's going to intervene in that situation. Now, the Redeemer will come to Zion and to those who turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. As for me, says the Lord, this is my covenant with them, my spirit who is upon you, and my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your descendants, from, nor from the mouth of your descendants. Descendants, says the Lord, from this time and forevermore. Isaiah the glorious light that shines in this world. That's what it's all about. Arise, shine, for your light has come, speaking of Jesus Christ. You know, <clears throat> Matthew uh, talks about how Jesus left um, Nazareth and went into Capernaum, and he, he shone like a light to Nebulon and Zebulon, a light in darkness. You know, that's Jesus Christ. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and the deep darkness the people, but the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles shall come to your light, and the kings to the brightness of your rising. One day everyone's going to come to Jesus, and they'll bow their knees before him, because he is the light, right? That's what he said, I am the light. Lift up your eyes all around and see, they all gather together, they come to you. Your sons shall come from afar and your daughters shall be nursed at your side. Then you shall see and become radiant and your heart shall swell with joy because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. The wealth of the Gentiles shall come to you. The multitude of camels shall cover your land and the dormant Areas of Medium and Ephra, all those shall, Sheba shall come. They shall bring gold and incense and they shall proclaim the praises of the Lord. <clears throat> all the flocks of Kedar shall be gathered together to you. The rams of Nibarath, something like that, shall minister to you. They shall ascend with acceptance on my altar and I will glorify the house of my glory. Who are those who fly like a cloud and like doves 
to their roosts. Surely the coastland shall wait for me and the ships of Tarshish will come first to bring your sons from afar, their silver and their gold with them to the name of the Lord your God and to the Holy One of Israel because he has glorified you. The sons of foreigners shall build up your walls and your king shall minister to you. For in my wrath I struck you, but in my favor I have had mercy upon you. Now, obviously, this will be in the future that God will then restore Israel as a nation. And we know that comes during the, uh, the tribulation period in the millennium. Therefore, your gates shall be open continually. They shall not be shut day or night that men may bring to you the wealth of the Gentiles and their kings in procession. For the nations and the kingdoms which will not serve you shall perish, and those nations shall be utterly ruined. The glory of Lebanon shall come to you, the cypress, the pine, and the box trees together, to beautify the place of my sanctuary, and I will make the place of my feet glorious." And again, this is speaking of that glorious appearing of Jesus Christ at his second coming when everyone will come. You know, when he comes, he's going to come right to Jerusalem, right to the the gates there at the Mount of Olives, and everybody will see him. I don't know how, but everybody will see him, whether it's TV or whether it's just, you know, it's going to be that that big and that great. And he will come and just... won't even need us to help him. He will be able to destroy and judge the world without us. Also, the sons of those who afflict you shall come bowing to you, and all those who despise you shall fall prostrated at the soles of your feet. And they shall call you the city of the Lord, Zion of the Holy One of Israel, whereas you have been forsaken and hated so that no one went through you. I will make you an eternal excellence, a joy of many generations. You shall drink the milk of the Gentiles and the milk, the, the breasts of kings. And you shall know that I, the Lord, am your Savior and your Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. Instead of bronze, I will bring gold. Instead of iron, I will bring silver. Instead of wood, bronze. Instead of stones, iron. I will also make your <coughs> officers peace and your magistrates righteousness. Violence shall no longer be heard in your land, neither... Uh, wasting nor destruction within your borders, but you shall call your walls salvation and your gates praise. The sun shall no longer be your light by day. Now this is all during that glorious appearing when God comes again. Nor the brightness shall the moon give light to you, but the Lord will be to you as an everlasting light and your God your glory. Your sun shall no longer go down, nor shall your moon withdraw itself. For the Lord will be your everlasting light, and the days of your morning shall be uh, ended. So there will be no more sun, no more moon. God will be our light completely. It's almost like, like we will constantly be drawn to the Lord because He is our light. He is our sustainer at all times. Your sun shall no longer go down, nor shall your moon withdraw itself. Um, verse 21 also your people shall all be righteous there we go they shall inherit the land forever the branch of my planting the work of my hands that i may be glorified now that's all the work of the lord notice he said all your people shall be righteous at that time he will make us all righteous when we finally get up there we will be complete Um, the wife that you want at that time, she will be everything that, that, that God has made her to be. And at that moment, the husband that you want, he will be everything that, that God had made him to be. And, and, and he's going to bless you even more because you won't be married. You'll be married to the Lord completely, and so you'll have utter peace and, and no more division within your relationships. I mean, it, it's total restoration. It is our hope and glory. It is what we work for and hope for on this earth that keeps us going for that one day a little one shall become a thousand and a small one a strong nation i the lord will hasten it in its time that's the glorious end of all earthly things when god will restore it all when lord will that happen that is the question no man knows the day or the hour when the lord returns and it could be soon but it's coming whether it's in my generation or the next generation it doesn't matter It is coming, and we need to work towards those things.